All right. Hello, everyone. So today I'll be giving an overview of the architecture that powers our language processing unit, or LPU. Um, this is largely a repeat of the talk I gave during the last ALCF workshop. Um, so if you've already seen this talk, I still encourage you to follow along. And if you have any new interesting questions, I'll make sure, hopefully, to leave time at the end, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions then. Um, the talk is going to largely be talking about the architecture, not necessarily focused only on large language models, even though that is been sort of uh, most of the you know public material related to Grok as of late. But hopefully, seeing these details of the architecture, even if you don't work on LLMs, you may uh, see other interesting opportunities for uh, applications, as the LPU had been designed for much more than just LLMs. Um, and uh, beyond that, I would actually also like to mention that tomorrow I will be doing a AMA on our Discord channel that uh, hey, TJ um, linked to in the previous slide, where I'll be talking a little bit more focused on LLMs and how we scale LLMs. So if that's a topic you're specifically interested in, you could check that out tomorrow. All right, so for, for this talk today, I'll be giving an overview of the LPU architecture, as I mentioned, before diving a little bit deeper into some of the key functional units behind the architecture. And finally, I'll be describing how the architecture allows uh, us to scale very efficiently to systems of hundreds to thousands of these LPUs. So I'll begin with uh, sort of this diagram of our packaging hierarchy, beginning with the Grok chip, which is built on our, based on our LPU architecture. We package this Grok chip into Grok cards and eight of such Grok cards exist in our Grok node. And then finally, we have nine of these Grok nodes within the Grok rack that's available in the ALCF testbed. So I'll begin with the left-hand side of this hierarchy, the Grok chip and the architecture that powers it. Fundamentally, the soul of the LPU is its determinism and its predictability and its execution, its predictability and its data movement. And this predictability really empowers our compiler, our software stack. It allows us to build a fully automated kernel-less compiler that can efficiently and then automatically map workloads onto the target hardware. Now not, now, not only does this predictability empower our compiler, it also allows us to achieve predictable low latency, which is very important and crucial for inference applications. And finally, and interestingly, this determinism, this predictability also allows us to scale very efficiently to, again, as I mentioned, systems of hundreds to thousands of these LPUs. Now, throughout this talk, I'll get into a little bit of more detail on, as to how this works, why predictability matters, and, and what we've built. But I'd like to quickly contrast this against more traditional compute platforms like GPUs and CPUs that are inherently non-deterministic in nature. They you know, are largely composed of you know, an array of cores that are operating asynchronously with one another and stitched together via a interconnection fabric and memory that is highly reactive, made, made up of dynamic hardware components that inherently makes uh, the architecture and hardware unpredictable. This unpredictability causes challenges in building an automated compiler that can efficiently map workloads to the chip. So most of these platforms heavily rely on software stacks that are based on kernels or manually created libraries of kernels that have been carefully crafted by iteratively profiling the hardware. Now this approach can work, but scales poorly and is, is very uh, is difficult to adapt as workloads change and as the architecture changes from generation to generation. Now, beyond that, this non-determinism also causes variances in latency, which is challenges, which, which causes challenges if you care about low latency inference. And of course, these challenges related to mapping a workload efficiently to the hardware also results in potential inefficient use of the architecture, which can lead to higher costs. Now, I get into much more detail into making the case of why predictable compute matters in a talk I gave previously back in December 2022, uh, where I described how in this era of, of deep learning, where the workloads are very data flow dominated, the algorithms are very predictable. And this presents an opportunity if we leverage predictable hardware, if we can combine predictable the predictable algorithms with the predictable hardware, we are we could potentially build this sort of holy grail of an automate an automated parallelizing compiler that is not kernel based that doesn't require these manual 
uh, hand to libraries of kernels. Um, so I won't get into the full details of the argument in this talk, but I do encourage you to check out um, the talk I gave previously. There's a recording online for that. So this is an overview of the LPU. Really, it's it's a it's a common sort of spec slide you would see for most accelerators describing the sheer amounts of memory bandwidth, compute bandwidth, and I/O bandwidth that are available in the chip. But I'd actually like to dive a little bit deeper into the architecture and how it's uh, formed and the foundational structures that make up the LPU. So the foundational building block of the LB LPU is the SIMD functional unit. This functional unit employs a set of vector operations and is supported by a very lightweight instruction dispatch unit. Now, you could think of this functional unit as the base class of the architecture, if you will. And what we do with this base class is we specialize it into various different types. And here I show four such examples of functional unit types that exist in the LPU. So we have the MXM for matrix vector, matrix, matrix multiply operations, the VXM for vector vector operations, the SXM for data reshape operations, and finally we have our memory unit for very high bandwidth on-chip memory. Now, what we do with these various different functional unit types is we stamp out multiple copies of them across the horizontal dimension of the chip with more copies of a given type offering more concurrency for the set of operations that that, that functional unit supports. Now, let's bring back the instruction dispatch units. Each functional unit has its own instruction dispatch unit, but crucially, uh, each of the instruction dispatch units are operating in lockstep offering a common time domain across the different functional units, which is essential for empowering our software. And finally, we'd like to have efficient uh, communication across the different functional units. So we introduce these stream registers for high bandwidth data passing between the different functional units. So this has described the overall structure of the architecture. Now I'd like to uh, dive a little bit deeper into describing how the architecture actually empowers our compiler. So beginning with memory, the Grok LPU architecture employs entirely software controlled memory. That means there's absolutely no dynamic hardware caching here. The compiler is aware of the physical location of all pieces of data within memory throughout the execution of the program. So this additionally means there's no memory hierarchy here. There's no L1, L2, L3. In fact, there's no notion here of a, a cache miss. The physical banks of memory that make up the memory uh, architecture are exposed directly to software and software is able to physically address the banks directly, understanding the exact location, again, of all data within memory for every cycle of execution of the program. Now, not only does this memory architecture empower our software, it also offers very amounts, of, very large amounts of on-chip memory capacity, so 220 megabytes in our first-generation LPU, and crucially, at very high bandwidth, up to 80 terabytes per second. Now, this high bandwidth is crucial uh, to allow the architecture to efficiently use the compute units on the chip, even for workloads that are at a very low operational intensity. Uh, for example, large language models uh, happen to possess this characteristic. They're largely memory bound. And so for these low operational intensity workloads, a high memory bandwidth architecture is crucial for saturating the available compute on the chip. Now for the functional units, as I mentioned earlier, the functional units execute in lockstep, offering a common time domain across the different functional units, which empowers the compiler to perform cycle accurate instruction scheduling. So you could think of this as synchronous execution of the various different threads on the chip, with each instruction dispatch unit issuing exactly one instruction for every cycle of execution of the program. Not only does this empower our compiler to do cycle accurate instruction scheduling, it actually is also uh, very cheap to implement in hardware. So less than 3% of the silicon area on the chip is dedicated towards this instruction dispatch logic, freeing up uh, as much area as possible for raw compute and memory. Now further, we'd like the functional units to be able to communicate with each other efficiently in a way that still empowers our compiler. And in order to do this, the LPU architecture employs a very simple one-dimensional interconnect 
for efficient data passing between the functional units. So this interconnect is made up of two uh, communication paths, one going eastward and one going westward, with each communication path consisting of an array of stream registers. And these stream registers, you can think of this as a effectively a single hop along this data path. Now, the simplicity of this interconnect allows the compiler to very quickly reason about all data movement between the functional units. And the simplicity is key. We don't have any uh, arbiters or queues within the interconnect. And this allows the software to easily reason about data movement without needing to perform any type of expensive simulation of the hardware. Uh, so that not only allows the compiler to uh, quickly and efficiently reason about data movement, it also allows it to do it very quickly to keep our compile times low. Uh, so for example, uh, if you have two functional units that are communicating with one another, the compiler can quickly reason about travel time between those functional units by doing a simple uh, add or subtract operation based on the relative positions of the functional units on the physical uh, on the physical layout of the chip. So putting this all together, these characteristics of the architecture, their intent is to give power of data orchestration entirely to the compiler. And this is illustrated quite clearly, I think, by uh, this animation which is showing a program that has been generated by the Grok compiler and without ever having run on any hardware is visualized by our Grok view tool that is available as part of our SDK. So what Grok view is doing here is taking the program uh, pro generated by the compiler and the information provided by that program and illustrating on a cycle by cycle basis, all execution that will happen on the chip. So this is this is uh, illustrating exactly what will happen on hardware without ever needing to run on hardware. And further, it's not actually doing any simulation of the hardware either. This is simply naively taking the information presented by the compiler and illustrating it for visualization purposes. So if you froze this animation, for example, at cycle 2000, without any needing to replay all the cycles that happened prior to cycle 2000, GrokView can visualize all memory accesses that will happen at that cycle, all instru instructions that are being dispatched, and all data that is in flight between different functional units. And this is all this information is available within the program generated by the compiler. So this is key. It's illustrating how the compiler is statically managing all data movement, all execution uh, within the program that is generated. So the hardware is not making any decisions anymore. All decision-making, the entire control plane has been lifted out of the hardware into software's hands. It's entirely software-defined hardware. So now that we've looked at the architecture at a macro level, let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the functional units that make up the architecture. So before I look at specific functional units, I want to highlight that the LPU is, in effect, a very large vector processor, where fundamentally the unit of communication between the various different functional units, as well as the unit of execution, is the vector. And in the first generation of our LPU, the size of this vector is 320 elements. So as a program executes, vectors of data are flowing across the different functional units via the stream registers with a given functional unit having the option for any given cycle to grab data off a stream register, perform some type of computation, and then taking the result of that computation, putting it back onto the stream register to continue flowing across other functional units for more computations. So let's look at some of these functional units one by one, beginning with the MXM, which is really the, the key workhorse of the chip and arguably the most important functional unit is offering very high bandwidth um, of compute for matrix matrix and matrix vector uh, mathematics, which is of course a key operation in deep learning workloads. And so in our first generation LPU, we have two such MXM units and each of these MXMs offer uh, matrix mathematics in two different numeric modes, int8 and float16. Flo and so in int8, uh, the MXM supports a 320 by 320 dot product, dot product and is able to do two of these concurrently on one MXM. Uh, so this is offering very high bandwidth compute. And for float16, slightly reduced bandwidth for the increased precision. So now the matrix uh, multiply is happening in a 160 by 320 shape and only one such 
um, dot product can happen per MXM on the chip. Now let's look at our VXM responsible for vector vector operations, and it supports a wide array of such vector vector operations, including arithmetic operations, logical operations, bitwise operations. It encompasses an, a set of operations that is enough to make the chip Turing complete. And if we dive a little bit deeper into the VXM architecture, it actually consists of an array of ALUs that can be chained together to form more interesting compute. And here I show such an example where four ALUs are chained together uh, to form a, a unit of compute. So the first ALU is responsible in this example for a reduction operation, um, you know, reducing two partial sums coming from the MXM, for example. A subsequent ALU then takes that result and performs a bias add. Then this is chained with another ALU that can perform an activation operation like a ReLU. And finally, a fourth ALU is responsible for doing a cast operation to cast to a desired data type for a downstream operation. And so this chaining of ALUs allows uh, the architecture to achieve very high bandwidth in its vector vector operations. And what's key is the compiler is able to do this chaining of ALUs automatically, analyzing the workload's dependency graph to automatically chain vector operations to maximize the efficiency and utilization of the VXM. Next, let's look at the SXM, which is responsible for data reshaping operations. So I mentioned um, earlier that the architecture is fundamentally a vector processor. And a key operation in a vector processor is the ability to change the way data is laid out within the vector. And so the SXM offers various different units that are capable of doing this at different bandwidths. Uh, so the first such unit is the distributor, which offers a very high bandwidth permutations within the vector, but is only able to operate within 16 byte chunks uh, within the vector. So high bandwidth, but limited permutation capability. So next there's the transposer, which is capable of matrix transposition. So it would take uh, a set of vectors that form a tensor and is able to transpose them as the vectors flow through the transposer and is able to do this again at a very high bandwidth. Next, there's the permuter, which is uh, capable of doing general permutation of the vector, but at a lower uh, bandwidth relative to the distributor. So more functionality, but less bandwidth. Additionally, the permuter unit is also able to do um, vector shifting operations, uh, and it is able to do this at a higher bandwidth relative to the general permutation operation. So combined, all these different functional units are leveraged by the compiler to make decisions as to how it implements various data reshape operations based on the bandwidth requirement, uh, based on the bandwidth required, as well as the functionality needed. Um, further, the SXM also encompasses access for our C2C units, our C2C units that are dedicated for LPU to LPU communication. And I'll get into that a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. And finally, we have our memory units that I've already discussed in some detail, but looking at the actual physical architecture of the memory uh, might be a little bit interesting. So uh, the memory units within the LPU architecture consist of a large array of memory banks. So uh, within the architecture, uh, we have this terminology that we refer to a memory slice, where there are 88 such memory slices within the LPU. And within each slice, there are two memory banks. So this is tons and tons of memory banks within the chip that are really allowing us to have such high memory bandwidth on chip, this 80 terabytes per second that I mentioned earlier that allows us to achieve high compute utilization out of our compute units like the MXM and the VXM. All right, so we've talked about the architecture at a sort of macro scale, talked about how it empowers our software. We dove a little bit into some of the functional units now I'd like to discuss how the, we leverage the architecture to scale to systems of hundreds to thousands of LPUs, which I believe is one of the key characteristics of the LPU architecture. So we've discussed again, back to the package hierarchy, the left-hand side of this hierarchy. Now I'm going to focus more on how we scale to, you know, not only within a Grok node, but also within a Grok rack and even a system of Grok racks. So fundamentally, the Grok architecture, the LPU architecture, employs a synchronous chip-to-chip -chip communication paradigm, which allows us to extend this notion of determinism, this predictability, 
beyond the boundaries of a single LPU to a full network of many LPUs. And this is empowered by the chip-to-chip -chip protocol that the architecture employs that implements a plesiochronous communication paradigm, which accounts for any natural clock drift that occurs across the different LPUs. And it accounts for this deterministically, exposing to our compiler a effectively common time domain across the different LPUs within the network. So this allows the compiler to view the network of LPUs effectively as a single LPU. So as part of the programs generated uh, by the compiler, it can look at the network of LPUs and understand that if it schedules a send from a source LPU at cycle n, it knows exactly and statically at some known um, cycle L or N plus L that the data will arrive at a destination LPU where that L is statically known thanks to the uh, plesiochronous communication system that accounts for natural clock drift across the different LPUs. So this is key. And not only uh, do we employ this chip-to-chip -chip protocol to empower the compiler, crucially, we also need to employ this software schedule direct network topology, um, which alleviates any required uh, dedicated router chips within the network. So a traditional network would have processors and separate router chips to deal with um, managing network traffic throughout the network. Instead, the Grok networks combine processor and router within the LPU, allowing the programs generated by the compiler to both schedule compute and network traffic throughout the execution of the program. So this is quite powerful. It allows the compiler to view the entire network as sort of a, a global optimization problem and manage traffic throughout the execution of the program. So there are no routers that are making local congestion sensing decisions. There's no adaptive routing that is needed. The compiler knows the exact location of all data throughout the network now and is able to make load balancing decisions statically. And again, it has this global view, something that an adaptive routing uh, network that is traditionally seen does not have. It only has local information. In comparison, these static networks allow the compiler to view the network globally and therefore make optimal network um, uh, load balancing decisions. So to double click on this concept, I, I illustrated here a very simple example comparing and contrasting a traditional non-deterministic network with a software scheduled network. So a traditional network would have each of its nodes sort of um, sensing the links local to it to make routing decisions. So it, it's assessing you know, back pressure, assessing link utilization based on local information and making adaptive routing decisions based on this information. Whereas a software schedule network, like the one employed by the Grok LPU, is able to understand at all every cycle of execution, all the links that are in use. And so for the example that's shown here, when processor A is making, uh, when the compiler, I should say, is making a decision as to how processor A should communicate with processor D, it can understand that the link between processor B and processor D is in use at this given time, and therefore use the route through processor C instead to communicate. So this information is available because all network traffic is statically known by the compiler. And this is, again, thanks to the determinism of the LPU that has been extended to the entire network. Now, the Grok LPU uh, network not only employs the synchronous communication paradigm, it also employs a very low diameter network, which is key for low latency inference applications. So the topology that's implemented in the Grok, uh, the, the current, the first generation Grok LPU systems is a dragonfly topology with these uh, local groups within each of the nodes that consist of eight LPUs that are densely connected via an all-to-all -all network or a complete graph. And then these groups are more sparsely connected with one another within a rack or within a set of racks. Um, so the key characteristic of this topology is that the number of hops between any two LPUs is kept to a minimum. So this is again described as a low diameter network you compare this to another network topology, for example, a torus, which would have potentially a much higher network diameter uh, given um, the, basically based on the maximum hop count between any two LPUs within the network. 
And again, this is an intentional decision to keep our latency of communication between the various different LPUs in the system very low. So the ramification of these two decisions, the synchronous communication paradigm, as well as the low diameter network, allows the Grok LPU to keep the overhead in the network very low, allows, allowing us to achieve very high efficiency out of the network, even when our message sizes are, kept, are very small. This is crucial for collective uh, operations uh, such as all reduce or all gather, um, which are commonly seen in various different uh, scale deep learning applications, especially in large language models. So we could see uh, results that we published in our most recent ISCA paper in 2022, where we showed that the Grok architecture is able to saturate the network bandwidth even at very small packet sizes. So even for tensor sizes as small as on the order of kilobytes. Now, this is particularly relevant, again, for large language models, for example, that commonly see very small units of communication for its collective operations, often in the order of tens of kilobytes, for example. And again, the combination of the synchronous communication paradigm employed, which minimizes the overhead in the network, coupled with the low latency of the uh, network topology, allows the Grok architecture to very easily saturate the network bandwidth even again for very small uh, tensor sizes. You compare this with more traditional networks, such as ones employed by GPUs that are higher latency and asynchronous communication. They have higher overhead and therefore require larger tensor sizes to saturate uh, the network bandwidth for these collective communication uh, operations. So we've showcased this, of course, and if you followed you know, any of our public material of late, We've really been pushing to showcase the benefits of the architecture via our state-of-the-art large language model inference performance. We show how we could scale across not just a single rack, not just a single node, but across a system of racks in order to achieve state-of-the-art performance on very large language models, uh, varying in sizes we've shown from 8 billion to 70 billion and beyond. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, as a quick recap on what we've covered, uh, I described an overview of the architecture and how it empowers our software via its determinism, its flat memory hierarchy, and its simple interconnect. We talked a little bit about some of the key functional units on the chip, the MXM, the VXM, the SXM, and memory. And finally, I've described how we leverage the architecture to scale to hundreds to thousands of Grok LPUs via its plesiochronous communication paradigm coupled with this low latency network topologies. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, if there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot.